Okay, this begins the discussion uh, on the reproductive systems. There'll be two lectures over chapter 26. The first will be over the male reproductive system, that'll be today, and then there'll be a second presentation over the female reproductive system. There are modules within the Martini textbook 26.1 and 26.2, as well as 26.5 that you should review on your own. These will go over uh, reproductive anatomy and histology that you should remember from Biology 105. I also wanted to take a moment to take a look with you at the mastering site so you know and anticipate what is coming up. So you can see here on your calendar that there are going to be some uh, a dynamic study module and that will be over the male reproductive system and there's a second uh, module over a little bit of male and female reproductive systems. The two extra credit quizzes are showing on the calendar. One is due on the 19th, and one is due a week later on the 26th. These are true extra credit quizzes. These are in addition to the 12 total quizzes that will be uh, available throughout the semester. The 11th and 12th quizzes, one on the reproductive and one on the urinary and acid-base balance, uh, are already available to you. And once you have taken all 12 quizzes, I will then go back and drop your two lowest quizzes and then I will add into the entire thing any points that you earn from the extra credit quizzes. These are completely optional. There are also three homework assignments due right before the exam on uh, urinary, acid base, and reproductive systems. So please uh, refer to mastering and uh, don't let any surprises occur. Work ahead. These are absolute deadlines and there's everything on here that you see is now available to you to begin working on. So back to the presentation. Again, look over the first couple of, of units on your own. And remember that as we discuss the reproductive systems, we're referring to the gonads, that is the, the actual uh, gamete and hormone producing organs of the reproductive systems, everything else being uh, the accessory organs, uh, and in the male, of course, most of those accessory organs are external versus the female, where most things are internal. The male gonads are the testes. Uh, testicle is a word that you'll see sometimes, but that's really a lesser used word uh, that is referring to uh, mo uh, more than just the testes typically. And so I prefer the word testes. Uh, remember that this is plural, that one testis versus two testes. Please spell that correctly. And, of course, these are the organs that are producing the gametes, the spermatozoa or the sperm, as well as the testosterone and the other androgen hormones. There's a series of accessory organs. You should be familiar with these, the ductus deferens, uh, the seminal glands, uh, and the prostate gland. Included in the accessory glands would be the urethra and the epididymis. Externally, uh, the penis and the scrotum. So review these structures on your own and be confident of them on the exam. Also in 26.2, uh, looking at the pathway of sperm production, starting in the testes, uh, going to the epididymis where the sperm are maturing, and then through the ductus deferens and the ejaculatory duct into the urethra. Also along the way, there are secretions from the accessory glands, and you should be easily able to uh, identify all the structures on this image. Review the uh, structures here in the discussion about the testes. The testes will drop, if you will, into the scrotum, descend into the scrotum um, before birth, typically. And there are along, adjacent to the kidneys, some connective tissue bands that do not elongate as the fetus grows. And, and um, this band is going to help pull the testes through the abdominal musculature into the scrotum. There are a couple of muscles involved in the scrotum, 
the dartus muscle. This one is going to elevate the testes and wrinkle the scrotal surface uh, when temperature changes uh, necessitate um, that closer um, moving of the testes to the body. And there's also the cremaster muscle, which is also going to pull it closer during uh, cold temperature. So we've got two different muscles that are involved with regulating uh, the closeness of the uh, testes to the body for optimizing sperm production. Within the scrotum and passing up through into the abdominal pelvic cavity or the spermatic cord, remember this is including everything that goes down into the, into the scrotal sac, including the ductus deferens, the blood vessels. Here you've got the papiniform plexus and the testicular artery. You've got nerves as well as a, a vast lymphatic structures. This is going to pass through the inguinal canal. So you can see here the inguinal canal, and this is where the spermatic cord is going to pass down out of the abdominal pelvic cavity into the scrotal sac. The testes have um, a tunica albiginia. This is the tough outer fibrous capsule uh, that is um, protecting the testes. And then the seminiferous tubules, of course, are the tubules within uh, the testes that are the site of sperm production. The RET testis, remember the, the term RET or retina or renaculum or reticulum is a network. So the RET is a passageway of the seminiferous tubules as they move toward and go toward the epididymis. So the RET testis again is this area. <clears throat> As you look, um, the reed testis will be in this area here as sperm are being produced within the seminiferous tubules. They're going to go through this network, the reed testis, into the epididymis. So that should be largely a uh, review. I want to slow down here and now spend a little bit more time on the process of spermatogenesis. Uh, spermatogenesis is the process of producing sperm and there are three processes involved in this. First of all, there's mitosis. There are, within the seminiferous tubules, uh, basically stem cells that are going to be replenishing themselves and replacing themselves through the process of mitosis. And remember that mitosis is making an identical copy and so you're creating two identical daughter cells like we discussed back in Biology 105. These are diploid cells. They have two copies of everything. And again, this is happening within the cortex of the seminiferous tubule. So remember, mitosis is simply a cell, what we would call a 2N cell, a diploid cell, dividing an identical copy of itself to make another diploid cell. So since this is a stem cell, and we don't want to use up the stem cells, the stem cell makes another stem cell. So this cell is an identical cell. It's the second daughter cell, which is identified as one that will continue through the process of spermatogenesis. So this first cell is always replacing itself, and the other cell then is the one moving forward in the production of sperm. The second process involved is meiosis. Meiosis, remember, is that special type of cell division that re, uh, is making haploid cells, making the gametes. And this is a double cycle within meiosis. There's meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. And as a result of meiosis, you're producing four haploid or single copy chromosome cells. In order to do this, there's going to be also a randomization of the genetic material and so the maternal and paternal chromosomes, the chromosomes you got from your mother and from your father, um, are going to reassociate and therefore create a randomization of the genetic material and creates a tetrad during this meiotic process. And then finally, the third process in spermatogenesis is spermiogenesis, 
which is a rapid differentiation of an immature male gamete into what you would recognize as a mature sperm. So again, going back over this, looking at the process of mitosis, these are those stem cells that are found along the cortex of the seminiferous tubules. So if you, this was a, a cross-section through the seminiferous tubule, you would find these stem cells around the outside edge of the cortex. And as spermatogenesis occurs, the cells will be migrating toward the lumen of the tube. The cell that Remember, the, the, the mitosis is going to form two daughter cells, one of which is going to be replacing itself. That one's going to remain along the basement membrane of the seminiferous tubule. The other one is now going to be considered the primary spermatocyte. That's the one that's going to continue its journey. This is going to take about 16 days okay, of development. So this is not a rapid process, although there are many, many cells doing this producing millions of sperm every day, each of these processes is, you know, relatively slow. The cells that are sitting around the outside edge, these stem cells are in fact called the spermatogonium, many of them spermatogonia. Then that primary spermatocyte is going to enter into meiosis one. And again, remember this is starting off as a diploid cell. And so the daughter cells here are going to be called secondary spermatocytes, and they will have already reduced their chromosome number down to 23 through this process. This is another 24 days or so for this process. Then the second round of mitosis, that secondary spermatocyte is going to divide to produce a spermatid. A spermatid has only 23 chromosomes in it, and this takes just a few hours. And then that last and final process is really more of a, uh, a physical maturation and a transformation as each spermatid matures into a single sperm. And this is another 24-day process of going from spermatid to mature sperm. So looking at this in graphical form, here was the spermatogonium sitting in the cortex of the seminiferous tubule. Here is the one daughter cell that it makes, which replaces itself. So this is still another stem cell replacing itself. This is the spermatogonium. That primary spermatocyte, remember it's still diploid, undergoes meiosis I. Meiosis I um, now is going to uh, form the secondary spermatocyte. The secondary sperm spermatocyte is going to enter into meiosis II. And you see that we get two secondary spermatocytes, which then will create four haploid spermatids, or spermatids, sorry. And notice that it says haploid N versus diploid 2N. And then through that maturation process of spermiogenesis, one creates four sp spermatozoa or sperm, and we recognize the head, the midpiece, and the tail structures of the sperm. Now the sperm has a couple of, of unique structures. This is also a review, but the very tip of the uh, sperm head is going to have an acrosome. This is a basically a, a sack of enzymes that are needed for fertilization. And recall that acro means extremity and zome means body. So we have a body at the extreme end of the head of the sperm. And the head itself is also going to contain the nucleus, which will have those 23 haploid chromosomes. There is the neck or the uh, the region where the centrioles will be, as well as the microtubules, and then uh, there's also a middle piece which has all the mitochondria. The mitochondria are necessary to make ATP so that the tail will 
move and allow motility of the sperm. Finally, the flagellum is a whip-like molecule or whip-like organelle that's going to uh, allow motility. So know the four uh, regions, if you will, of the mature sperm, the acrosome right at the very, very tip, the head, then the neck region, <clears throat> centrioles are there, the middle piece has all the mitochondria, you see them lined up, lined up there, and then the tail or the flagellum for the rest of it. So let's go through some of the structures of the male. Seminiferous tubules, again, are tightly coiled tubes uh, found within the uh, testis. This is where the sperm are being produced. And if you take this entire process in total, I've mentioned the individual days, but in total, about nine weeks or so, for spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis to occur, and every tubule and every part of the seminiferous tubules is continuously making the sperm throughout life after puberty. So histologically, recall from 105, we had these seminiferous tubules. Each one is in cross-section, and there's a lumen in the very center. Those spermatogonia are the cells around the outside edge, and as sperm are being produced, they're moving toward the lumen and are released into the lumen. And within the lumen, you'll find the spermatids, those early cells that are still undergoing some maturation um, into mature sperm. Now there's some connective tissue structures around each of the seminiferous tubules, and there's going to be some... some um, areolar tissue, some loose connective tissue, some blood vessels, and there's going to be a large number of lytic cells or interstitial cells. And these are the cells that actually produce the testosterone as well as the other um, androgen hormones um, that are important in maintaining and producing male structures. So, as I've said, along the wall of the seminiferous tubule, one will find spermatogonia, and then you will see spermatocytes and In addition, there will be nurse cells, also called Sertoli cells, after the person that described them. And these cells are going to be very important. They're going to be surrounding and, as the name suggests, supporting and nurturing the producing uh, spermatocytes. And then spermiation uh, is the process in which a spermatozoan Loses, loses attachment to the nurse cells and enters into the lumen. So spermiation, simply the, the release of the spermatozoa in, or from the nurse cell and into the lumen. Now, there's a really important process to imagine here. Sperm, because they are haploid uh, and recombined structures genetically, right? They're carrying uh, some of... Uh, a, new cr a new combination of genetic material, each sperm would be recognized by the male reproduct by the male uh, lymphatic system and by their immune system as foreign. So it's important that the sperm are being produced in an area that is away from any of the body's immune system. So these nurse cells are providing a or creating a blood testis barrier. This is similar to the blood brain barrier that we saw in the brain where the brain was being especially protected from toxins. Here, uh, the newly produced sperm are being protected from the body's own immune system. If there's a breakdown in this tight junction caused by the nurse cells, this can be a, a reason for uh, infertility in men if, in fact, their body is destroying their own sperm. Now, the blood testis barrier is, is uh, made up of two compartments. There's a basal compartment where the spermatogonia are located, and then there's a luminal compartment where the rest of the processes of meiosis and spermatogenesis are occurring. Now, once the sperm are released uh, from the testis, they're now physically mature, but they're still not 
capable of fertilizing. Uh, they're still immobile. There are other structures that we're going to see here that are necessary for them to become functionally mature, for them to be nourished, uh, where they'll be stored, and eventually how they'll be transported. Capacitation is the term used to uh, describe the activation of sperm. This is the process where the sperm becomes completely modal and fully functional and occurs in basically two steps. Number one, the seminal gland secretions, and we'll get to the seminal vesicle in a moment, but the, the seminal gland secretions are going to help the spermatic zoa become motile, motile as well as um, becoming uh, fully capable of, of fertilization occurs when the sperm is introduced into the female reproductive tract. So once the sperm are released into the lumen, they're going to head toward the epididymis. The epididymis is that comma-shaped structure, and it's a coiled tube on the posterior border of each testis, quite long, about 23 feet or so of tubing, and it is lined with pseudostratified columnar with really long stereocilia, uh, basically just really long cilia that are increasing this, the surface area. And as the sperm are moving through this epididymis, they are undergoing a lot of maturation here. The epididymis is divided into three parts, the head, uh, which is receiving this, the sperm, the body, the majority of it, and then the tail that is uh, having a fewer number of coils and then will connect to the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. So in the picture you can see within the testis all these seminiferous tubules. The sperm are moving through those lumen to the reet testis. The reet testis is that network or that net of tubing which then drop into the head of the epididymis. The majority of it is the body and then down toward the end there is the tail and the tail is then going to connect into the ductus deferens and upon ejaculation carry it up through the spermatic cord. The ductus deferens is going to be um, you know about uh, 16 inch long or so um, tube it's going to pass up through the inguinal canal and as part of that spermatic cord it's going to transport the sperm from the epididymis up to what is referred to as the ampulla. Now the ductus deferens though, can also spore, uh, store sperm for several months and so um, this is why after, for example, a, a um, vasectomy, it's, in, it's important that there's a waiting period because there can be sto uh, sperm stored up in the vas deferens beyond the point of where the severing was of the cord. Then, as the sperm are moving through the ductus deferens or the vas deferens are going to move into the ejaculatory duct, the ejaculatory duct is now going to merge into the prostate gland. So the ductus deferens is coming up, testis, epididymis comes up, and will merge. This is the ejaculatory duct, and the ejaculatory duct will merge with the seminal vesicle and merge into directly into the prostate and then into the urethra, the prostatic urethra that is passing through the prostate. These, of course, are the ureters coming down from the kidneys, emptying into the bladder. So the ductus deferens come up and are associated with the bladder. The ductus deferens is going to have a very thick wall of muscle, as well as a lumen that I said before was lined by pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. This muscle will be important for uh, the rhythmic uh, contractions necessary for ejaculation. 
Now, once the sperm are passing up through the vas and into the ejaculatory duct, they're going to start mixing with the seminal fluid. This fluid is going to be coming from a number of places, uh, the seminal glands, largely, the seminal vesicle glands, but also uh, the prostate gland and the bulbourethral glands, and the epididymis itself and the nurse cells, the Sertoli cells themselves, were also combining to the total fluid. Per ejaculate, somewhere between 2 and 5 milliliters um, on average. Let's talk about each of these accessory glands. These should be familiar to you. The seminal glands or the seminal vesicles. These are going to be sandwiched between the posterior wall and the urinary bladder, as you saw, and the rectum. They have um, secretions uh, ejected by smooth muscle. You're not surprised by that. And the secretions here are going to stimulate the flagellar movement of the sperm, and it's the first step in the capacitation, the maturation, uh, or the, the uh, maturing of the sperm to become able for fertilization. These glands are produced in the vast majority of the seminal volume. The prostate gland, one of them, walnut-shaped gland, it is going to encircle the proximal urethra as it leaves the bladder. It is producing the majority of the rest of the volume, 20 to 30 percent of the seminal volume, and secretes a seminal plasmid molecule, which is basically a naturally occurring antibiotic which is going to help reduce the number of UTIs in males. The bulbourethral glands, also named after who described them, Cowper, Cowper's glands, uh, these are located at the base of the penis. They have a, their own duct that dumps right into the urethra and will be producing a, an alkaline mucousy uh, secretion, which is going to help neutralize the urine and the other acids along the urethra as well as act as a lubricant. So finally we'll finish up with uh, structures of the penis. So we have uh, of course two functions uh, for the passing of urine through the urethra as well as the passage of semen. Structures of the penis include the root, this is the fixed portion, um, just inferior to the pubic symphysis. There is the body or the shaft of the penis, and then the neck uh, between the shaft and the glands. The glands is the most distal end uh, at the urethral orifice, and then the prepuce or the, the foreskin um, is attached to the neck and continues over the gland's penis when intact or could be removed um, through a circumcision. So taking a look at these images, again, um, pubic symphysis and the root of the penis, the body, and now the neck, the glands toward the tip and the urethral or the external urethral orifice. Within the Penile structures we'll be talking about in a moment, the corpus cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum. These are going to support uh, the urethra and also create the blood-filling venous structures for erection. And here you can see the urethra coming down, um, and the bladder is not shown here. Looking at it from a different angle, um, again, you can see the testis, the epididymis, the vas deferens coming up, merging into the ejaculatory duct with the seminal vesicle. Semen is now in the prosthetic urethra. Fluid from the prostate is adding. Fluid from the bulbourethral glands will also be contributing. Those bubble urethral glands are right in that muscle layer, referred to as the urogenital diaphragm. And then that little tiny region of the urethra is called the membranous urethra. And the majority of the urethra is going to be considered the penile or the spongy urethra. Spongy because it passes through and is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. These 
blue regions on either side represent the corpus cavernosa, the blood filling chambers for erection. Penis has uh, two, two uh, some layers. There's an outer skin layer, uh, very similar to the thin skin of the scrotum, and there's some muscle that's continuous with the dartus muscle of the scrotum. There's also some underlying areolar tissue, and also a fair amount of elastic tissue, allowing for recoil um, from erection. The erectile tissues. There's a three-dimensional network of vascular spaces. Uh, these vascular spaces uh, include the corpus cavernosa, two large cylindrical masses, and also the corpus spongiosum, which is directly around the urethra. So when you look at the penis in cross-section, I'm always reminded of a bug's life. It looks like one of those, one of those big ants, two big eyes, right? But those two big eyes are the corpus cavernosa, and you can see that there is a uh, blood vessels that are filling these areas. Then here is the urethra surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. And then you can also see that there are a, a venous supply to the penis, and then the layers of skin, uh, the outer layer resembling more like the scrotum, and then a dermis that has some muscle in it uh, connected to the dartus and then underlying that some areolar tissue. And that areolar tissue makes room for and allows for uh, space for the superficial arteries, veins, and lymphatic vessels. During male sexual response, arousal can be brought upon by uh, simply uh, thoughts or sensory stimulation of the genital region. Uh, this is through parasympathetic stimulation of the pelvic nerves. There is a simultaneous release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator, and this is going to engorge the corpus cavernosa and the spongiosum for erection. There will also be, with this arousal, a uh, potential release and secretion of the lubricating fluids from the bulbourethral glands. Emission is now a sympathetic activation and this is going to be a peristaltic contraction of the muscles of the duct ductus deferens and it's going to allow for the sperm to be released and mixed with the seminal glands and the prostate gland. Now at this point you have semen. Ejaculation is that powerful rhythmic contraction. And there are some muscles involved with this, the bulbo cav uh, cavernosus muscle at the base is pushing the semen toward the urethra, and there's also an ischial cavernosus muscle that is stiffening uh, the erect penis along the sides. This is sympathetic, but also there's some lower lumbar and upper sacral segments of the spinal cord that are also contributing to the ejaculatory process. And collectively, this is orgasm. Now, uh, some uh, people remember point and shoot, simply reminding us that uh, pointing, erection, is a parasympathetic nervous system phenomenon, whereas shoot, or ejaculation, is a sympathetic nervous system phenomenon. So this is one of those rare moments where both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems need to be working together in a cooperative way to allow for male um, erection and ejaculation. Now, we can't turn on the television without hearing about ED, and so the inability to achieve or to maintain an erection. Uh, various problems here could be related to blood pressure changes, uh, not enough blood pressure to uh, allow for the blood filling. Uh, there could be interference with the, the signals of the sympathetic, or, or in this case, parasympathetic signals, or there could even be psychological factors that make this more difficult. The Viagra and Cialis, uh, Cialis commercials uh, basically are inactivating enzymes that oppose nitric oxide. Remember, nitric oxide is that, that very potent vasodilator. And once the nitric oxide is released, of course, it is uh, broken down 
so that erection does not last, as the commercials say, more than four hours. And so uh, the, these medications are going to um, inactivate the breakdown of the enzymes and so that they will last longer and allow production of the erection. Overall, the uh, hormonal interactions related to the male reproductive system include the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to be releasing GnRH. We talked about these hormones back in the endocrine unit, so this should be somewhat familiar. The gametotropin releasing hormones are going to be released and target the anterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland is then going to be releasing two gonadotropins. Remember that tropin or tropin means a protein that is influencing. So the gonadotropins are proteins influencing the gonads. And these two produced by the anterior pituitary include luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle stimulating hormone. Now, I know I mentioned it before, but while we normally think of these two hormones as being, quote, female hormones, we'll see here that these two hormones have very important roles in male uh, reproduction as well. So the luteinizing hormone is going to be target, targeting the interstitial cells. Remember, those are also called the lytic cells. And these are the cells producing the testosterone. And so this luteinizing hormone is going to help uh, with the production of testosterone. Now, when testosterone gets too high, there can be a feedback inhibition of the GnRH. The FSH is going to be going down and targeting the seminiferous tubules, specifically the nurse cells, those Sertoli cells. And they're going to be promoting spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. They're secreting, these nurse cells are secreting ABP, androgen binding protein, which will be very, very important for stimulating the maturation of the spermatids. The Sertoli cells are also secreting inhibin, and inhibin is going to go back and inhibit FSH and provide a feedback control of spermiogenesis. So looking up here at the hypothalamus, hypothalamus is releasing GnRH. It's traveling a short distance to the anterior pituitary. Remember there was that blood shunt here between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. And that GnRH is going to affect some gonadotropin-producing cells, producing LH and FSH. LH will travel through the blood and travel and affect the lytic cells to make more testosterone. The FSH will travel to the Sertoli cells and stimulate inhibin, and inhibin will now allow a feedback regulation of the FSH in, in the first place. Testosterone is not only important for producing sperm, but also for maintaining uh, sex drive, stimulating bone growth and muscle growth. This is one of the reasons that men have more muscle mass is because of testosterone. It also stimulates bone growth. Remember that testosterone is important during uh, puberty for lengthening the uh, and encouraging the, the lengthening of the long bones. And it's important for securing and, and uh, initiating the secondary sex characteristics at puberty and for maintaining all the accessory glands and organs that we've discussed. So you can see in this image, uh, this is 26.7 in your textbook, but testosterone is made by those lytic cells, the interstitial cells, but not only does it stimulate the Sertoli cells and therefore inhibit, but it also, as I just mentioned, has a lot of other functions on, on sex drive, muscle and bone growth, maintenance of the other structures, and the accessory glands. One of the most important hormones produced uh, is DHT, dihydrotestosterone. And this is a form of testosterone that is uh, very, very potent. 
and about 10% of all the circulating testosterone in your body is in this form, dihydrotestosterone, DHT. This can do all the same things that testosterone does, um, but some tissues only respond to DHT and they don't respond to testosterone. So the external genitalia only respond to DHT. Other tissues are more sensitive to testosterone, uh, for example, the prostate. So we have basically two forms of testosterone, DHT, and full testosterone. And I'm going to stop there for today. This will be a little bit of a shorter lecture. And the next lecture will cover the female reproductive system. And part of your job, much of this is review, but much, part of your job will also be to be comparing and contrasting male and female reproductive system. And the questions that you'll find in the mastering assignments and in the quiz will help guide you as you prepare for the exam.